I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Solo New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus LeBron. This month, we're here along Arthur Avenue in the Belmont section of the Bronx. The street is one of the area's biggest draws, bringing tourists from around the world to arguably the city's last vibrant Little Italy. The tight-knit neighborhood was the backdrop for the Robert De Niro-directed film A Bronx Tale. But like other areas in New York, the neighborhood has changed, and Italians who've stayed have been joined by other immigrant and ethnic groups. On this episode, the real Little Italy, Arthur Avenue maintains its identity while other Italian enclaves disappear. Saints Work, a hospital that's diagnosed high housing costs as a public health issue. And Drawn from Nature, a miniature exhibit that pulls a big audience. Those stories and more coming up as we explore the Belmont section of the Bronx. For more than a century, Belmont was known as a vibrant and thriving Italian enclave. In the last decade or so, the number of Italians in the neighborhood has declined steadily. Despite these changes, the area has managed to maintain the moniker, the real Little Italy. Gary Pierre Pierre tells us how. For more than a century, the pews of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in the Belmont section of the Bronx has served not only as a spiritual, but as a social hub for millions of Italian immigrants. Immigrants like Carmelina Scarizervos, who was nine years old when she came to New York. It means maintaining my spirit as a Catholic or Christian person, knowing that when I want to pray, I can come here and meditate on my religious upbringing, that there are moments when I need quiet. I can come here and join groups, different kind of people, not belonging to just the Italian families, but to other cultures if they want to pray, and we pray together, or alone if I want to be alone. This is a symbol to me of my upbringing. The church is also a beacon to the newcomers, however, the pews are not as full as they once were, despite the parish adding masses in Spanish. I would expect more people to come. I really wouldn't want to say that it's not as full as it was, but it isn't, because there are other religious groups now in the area. Even with the influx of new faiths and faces, the neighborhood has maintained its strong Italian identity. According to the Belmont Business Improvement District, there are about 3,000 Italians out of the roughly 30,000 residents in Belmont. One of the things still keeping the neighborhood Italian are the longtime businesses like Biancardi's Meats. The shop's been on Arthur Avenue for more than a century. Sal Biancardi has helped run the family business for years. The, the secret is just getting up every day, coming to work, providing a quality product at a very reasonable price. And what we found through the years is that the people that my grandparents waited on and my father and my uncle waited on, um, their children and grandchildren are now, have now become customers. So everything flows from one generation to the next. While the number of Italians have decreased significantly in the area over the last decade, there is no fear that it will lose its Italian identity anytime soon, says Frank Franz, the treasurer of the Belmont Business Improvement District. People of every background come and shop here uh, because you can't get what you have here just anywhere. Uh, not this level of quality, uh, this level of, uh, of abundance, and at the price. So you get quality, you get selection, and you get price all in this neighborhood. In an ironic twist of fate, Belmont's relative distance from Manhattan and Brooklyn has kept its identity while other traditional Little Italy's have faded. A lot of other of the historic Little Italy's are uh, in areas that became gentrified. 
prices went up. I mean, it's not just the Little Italy's. You have uh, the old Eastern European section in Alphabet City, which is largely gone. Uh, the Jewish section down on Orchard Street is largely gone. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, ethnic neighborhoods in general have changed because, for one thing, as far as Italians go, Italians or very few come here anymore. So Italians become Americans <laughs> after a period of time, as we all do, you know. Uh, and with the changing in uh, of uh, property values that went up and rents that went up in other areas, economics forced a lot of people out. Part of the allure is that Belmont feels like a small town despite being part of the country's largest city. Well, you know, uh, the Bronx has been a place uh, it's, it's actually sort of like a, an incubator for immigrants. I mean, millions of immigrants have come to the Bronx as their first stop, you know, made their lives, and their children became successful and moved out. But Carmelina did not move out. She is raising her only child, Angelina Zervos, in the neighborhood. Angelina is a student at nearby Fordham University. She feels very differently about her Little Italy upbringing. This church is home. I mean, usually churches are a gathering place for communities and I think this one in particular really is. It was for the Italian community that was here and it's for the new people that have moved in and it's sort of like a beacon. I'm Italian-American but this community while it's based on the idea of Little Italy in the Bronx it isn't so Italian anymore so I'm sort of at the crossroads of the old world, the old relationship to the neighborhood as this, you know, white Italian girl, but it's also not so Italian anymore. And how do I fit into that? How do you fit into that? I think I fit in pretty well. <laughs> I have lots of friends here. Some of my best friends are neighborhood kids, regardless of wh what our background is. For Diverse City, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. <laughs>
and the Albanian influx is welcomed. There's 11 restaurants here now, basically on the same street. We're all friends, we all get along. There's also some Albanian restaurants, which is very nice, a little different. Something different to eat, you know, if you don't want to eat Italian. We all get along with them, and we have Albanians that work for us. Um, they're very family-oriented people. Italians are very family-oriented people. A people, Rezai says, are hungry to leave their mark on their new home. I'm proud of them because they work very hard, and they are family people. And we try to leave something to our kids that we do something for our future. Bronx native and former social worker Susan Birnbaum has turned her love of Belmont and its rich Italian history into a popular tour. She runs a sightseeing company called Susan Says NYC Walkabouts. Birnbaum took our producer, Crystal Lowe, to a few of her favorite spots along Arthur Avenue. When I became a tour guide, I decided my tours would be about the things that I knew best. One of the neighborhoods I knew best was Belmont, also known as the real little Italy in the Bronx. And if you say Arthur Avenue, that's also a key word. And what you have here is sort of a little walk back in time. Um, you have mom and pop, 35 mom and pop shops. And um, some of the stores and shops and restaurants have been in the family sector at least, I would say, six generations. It, it looks the same as it did uh, forever, unlike a lot of places that have changed a lot. So, um, and the people here, as we walk around, you see the shopkeepers really take pride in what they do. So we're in and out of lots of the shops, and we have bread, and we have salami, and we have pizza. And, uh, it, and while we're walking, I usually give a little history of the neighborhood. So this is another, they make pizza and hot sandwiches. It became an Italian neighborhood turn of the century. I've heard a priest would meet people at the boat when they disembark and would encourage people to come up to the Bronx because they were building the botanical gardens and they were building the zoo. And they needed stone cutters and, and the Italian immigrants had the skills that they needed. And the market that we're in, we're in the Arthur Avenue market. It was one of many markets that um, Mayor LaGuardia opened in 1940. His idea was to get people off the street, to get the push carts off the street because supposedly they weren't very sanitary. I think it really was a way to control the markets in a way. And um, so people actually literally, put, they, they wheeled their push cart into the space. And at some point, there were close to 100 push carts in this area. Over the years, it changed a lot. Um, some people took storefronts, some people went out of business. Um, and what we have now are six to seven businesses. Um, we have the Bronx Beer Hall, we have a Butcher Shop Peter's Meat Market, we have Mike's Deli, we have a pizza place in the back, and we have uh, Mount Carmel Foods, uh, imported foods, we have a bakery, we, and we have an ice cream stand. So the Bronx Beer Hall has been inside of the heart of the Arthur Avenue retail market for coming up seven years now. Uh, we opened a beer hall here because beer halls are inherently communal spaces and what better place than the number two tourist destination in the borough. As long as I've been here, I've seen her bring a lot of different faces to the borough and a lot of new faces to Arthur Avenue overall. Um, not only does she have a steady flow of new customers, but you see a lot of repeat customers just based on all the information that they received from Susan the first time around. My name is Christopher Borgatti and I'm a third generation of Borgatti's making ravioli and pasta here in Little Italy in the Bronx. And actually, uh, this store was opened November 28, 1935 by my grandfather and grandmother. My grandfather's name was Lindo, my grandmother's name was Maria. And they were teenagers when they left Bologna, Italy. So now, as time went on, uh, being that grandma had some recipes, because she used to make ravioli at home, the noodles, things like that, uh, they 
actually opened up a mom and pop business right here in this location, but we were only a half a store at that time. And it was grandma's recipes, of course, that launched this. Much of the success of the neighborhood too is, is having that family atmosphere. And I think, you know, we all kind of help each other in a way, in that sense, you know. You'll have many of the restaurants, they, they have the luxury uh, of buying fresh fish, meats, uh, pastas, the bread to serve in their restaurants. And uh, I know many times we all help each other when push comes to shove. And uh, it's, it's important because you need to have a, a strong community in order to have it continue for the next 100 years. St. Barnabas Hospital has teamed up with l &M Development to create two affordable housing buildings on 3rd Avenue with apartments set aside for the formerly homeless. St. Barnabas President and CEO David Perlstein explains how and why he took on housing as a healthcare issue. If you have housing insecurity, you can't take care of all your other medical issues or any other clinical issues. It's impossible to get well if you don't know where your meal's coming from, you don't know um, uh, where you're going to sleep the next night. When I started, we were a different organization, and we were really focused on episodic care, the way everybody else was, which we call fee-for-service, where the way we got paid was really by something called a threshold visit. If you came across the threshold, you got paid. So most organizations were seeing patients as often as possible in order to make ends meet. A big change after 2007 was the expansion of the mandatory Medicaid through a managed care. At the same time that this happened, New York State was starting to think about patient-centered medical home models. And those are models that actually increase the amount of money that organizations get for doing the right thing. And we thought, all right, let's come up with a program that will be transformational for the community that we will deliver on our promise to, to actually do good for the community, not just as a healthcare provider, but as a anchor institution partner who's interested in the improvement of the community. We were able to partner with this developer who had access to funds that we didn't have access to, and they agreed to take this on and build two housing units that will hold about 314 individual apartments. It should be around 1,000 people living there. On top of that, they agreed with all of our, our mission to the community about health and wellness. The housing was actually financed by all the tax credits that they had access to. Our build-out was actually financed by, in part, the Bronx Borough President actually dedicated a million dollars to the rooftop farm. And New York State, through their foundation grants, actually gave us a, a $22.6 million uh, foundation grant to support the build-out. Without that, it never could have happened. Because unlike other organizations in other communities, I don't have access to the philanthropy that, that other folks have. The summit was reserved for, for homeless. We have actually 90, over 90 units that are reserved for previously homeless individuals. One of the benefits of what's going on here is we have prevented the gentrification from occurring. And I will tell you, the property prices along Third Avenue now have skyrocketed because people see the writing on the wall. We are in a very interesting area up here. We have Arthur Avenue, you know, Little Italy, the Bronx. We have the Bronx Zoo. We have Fordham University. People are, are starting to salivate a little bit about the, the real estate. And so it was important for us to be able to protect our neighbors from that for as long as we could. Because it's not right that I have people living in these communities for their entire lives who have housing insecurity to not benefit from some of those things that are out there. This community is still dominated by women and children. So we have a women's and children's program that we're going to be putting in there, which is a one-stop shopping for moms and their kids. So it'll be OBGYN and it'll be pediatrics. So we are putting in a gym. We have a teaching kitchen, as I mentioned, which we're very excited about. And that teaching kitchen, uh, through Project Eats, is going to be a phenomenal program, which is going to allow us to teach our house staff, our residents, our medical students, our nurses, our attendings, and the community 
how to prepare foods in a healthier manner, how to use less oil, how to use fresh foods. And that aligns again with our, our rooftop garden. And actually we have a green market that already is open, a farmer's market that we've already started opening here in, on campus. And that again is to get people to eat fresh vegetables because we do have a community that wants to keep their kids healthy. They want to be healthier. They, they, they read about what that means. There are lots, of, you know, we, we know in these kinds of community, there are food deserts. Now I would argue, I have Arthur Avenue down the street. It's not really a food desert, but it isn't where my patient populations necessarily will go to shop. And I know that we are seeing a not in my backyard approach in the rest of the city, but it's the mission of my organization to take care of these people. It's what I believe in. And I believe that they have every right to maximize the goodness in their lives. They have as much right as I have, and we can be a part of improving that. The New York Botanical Gardens Holiday Train Show is now in its 28th year here in Belmont. The ever-changing model train display is artistically crafted by the folks at the Kentucky-based studio Applied Imagination. Laura Bussey Dolan, the daughter of the visionary founder Paul Bussey, now heads the company. Bussey Dolan and New York Botanical Gardens' Karen Dobman tell us about the work that went into this year's display in their own words. We're inside in an indoor winter wonderland, and we've got more than 25 trains running and 175 New York landmarks made out of plant parks. So all of the beautiful architecture you see is made out of nuts, twigs, berries, bark, leaves, all those sorts of things you can imagine. The New York Botanical Garden has been representing in the Bronx for more than 125 years. Uh, we're a landmark in this community, and we love that we can have visitors coming um, all times of year. The Holiday Dream Show this year is in a whole new space and we are focused on Central Park this year. So we've reworked that collection and added many new buildings and bridges and the details are just spectacular. This work I hope brings out the kid in every age. There's something about kind of being transformed in a space like this with all of the models and the trains kind of whirling by that just kind of brings out a magic in all of us. The New York Botanical Gardens Holiday Train Show is our longest running display. Uh, we've had a relationship with them since 1992 and it's grown and grown every year since. The Botanical Gardens found my father through word of mouth. He had at that time been doing these small garden railways for things like the Ohio State Fair. Um, we have a local conservatory in Cincinnati that he had joined up with around kind of the same time. The relationship with these conservatories was actually how the idea for these houses all being built out of natural material was born. Because my father said, I don't want to put a plastic building in and amongst these beautiful plants. It's not the right setting for it. And thus the idea was born to make architectural models out of plant material. So most things are prefabricated ahead of time at our workshop uh, and then uh, sent by freight uh, here for the construction within the space, which takes about two and a half weeks. And everything from birch trees being shipped in to, from Maine or cedar being uh, freighted up from Kentucky to the different track layouts that we build and bring up from our workshop or the, the plants that we have to bring in, which there's over 2,000 plants in this installation this year. There's over 175 models. There's over 2,000 feet of track. So it's a massive undertaking that takes a huge team of people to pull off. I hope to see this train show continue on for many, many years and uh, coming into this as kind of the new leader um, of this company, I have an energy to take this even further than we ever have before and just explore new ways of applying the same fundamentals that my father founded this company on, kind of pushing the boundaries of that to see how far we can go.
Finally, we wanted to move a little outside of Arthur Avenue to Fordham Plaza. That's where the Bronx-based creative agency, Blocks, the quarterly magazine Edible Bronx and the Fordham Bid bring together some of the Bronx's renowned flavor and flavor. From May through October, for the last two years, local groups including food vendors from around the borough have gathered on Saturday night for the Bronx Night Market. Here's a taste. That's our look at Belmont in the Bronx. On behalf of all the good folks who work on our show, I'd like to wish you and your family happy holidays. Join us next month when we'll head to Flatbush, Brooklyn, to an area that's being called Little Haiti. Till then, step outside and explore our diverse city. <laughs>